Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're heading to uh, five past six, so I thought I'd make a start, start. First of all, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, NC National Centre of Sport and Exercise Medicine, NCSEM and FSEM, Faculty of Sport and Exercise Medicine, Seminar on Physical Activity and Serious and Mental Health. Um, I'm going to kick off by um, talking through a few housekeeping rules. Hopefully you can see the slide on your screen. Um, somebody, what Flo, could you just wave to make sure, confirm that we can see that? Thank you very much indeed. Um, just the key points are um, on entry, your camera and is switched off and you are muted. Um, if you don't mind um, keeping it that way, that'd be much appreciated, enables the session to run more smoothly. Um, we are recording. Um, so if you switch your camera or sound on, then you may appear and indeed your living room, your pets and indeed whatever else is in your background may appear in the recording and will be available online. So just to make that clear, um, there will be a question and answer session at the end. Um, and if anyone has a question, please, can you put it in the chat? We'll monitor the chat and we'll deal with that at the end of the seminar, at the end of um, the, the sessions from our speakers. And 1.5 CPD points are available to participants who view this seminar. Uh, and details how to claim points as well as a link to the recording of the session will be sent in the next few days. So I hope that's all, all nice and clear. We're all very, very much used to these uh, these ways of working now. So as I said, welcome. Good evening. My name's uh, Mark Lewis. I'm the Dean of the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. Uh, and I'm one of the um, co-directors uh, of the National Centre of Sport and Exercise Medicine. Um, I'm sure that you're aware of the NCSM, but I will tell you a little bit about it just for those who aren't. Um, and also um, to talk a little bit, to, to let you know that we've been doing this series of seminars online to replace our annual conference, which of course, like many, 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 many of these, uh, these events have had to be um, replaced by um, virtual events over the course of the last year or so. Um, the National Centre of Sport and Exercise Medicine um, is a 2012 Olympic Legacy Programme. Uh, from the Department of Health to improve the nation's health through sport, exercise and physical activity. Uh, it was seeded by 30 million pounds of capital um, spread across three sites of 10 million per site, one in Sheffield, uh, one in Loughborough, and one in London. Um, and we have now all been up and running for quite some time. Um, the building projects completed a number of years ago and all in all cases, actually part of bigger programs around um, the the remit of improving the nation's health through sport, exercise and physical activity. Uh, we have directors for each of the three sites and, the, the, and between us, we direct the, the, the NCSEM programme. And we work in uh, five areas, um, which are exercises, medicine, prevention, musculoskeletal and sport injuries, performance health and mental health. And it's that final um, area today that we're really, that final area is what we're gonna concentrate on most today. So without further ado, I will we'll make a start. I'll introduce you to our first speaker, and it's Professor Simon Gilberty from the University of York. Uh, Simon is a founder and director of the Mental Health and Addictions Research Group at the University of York. He teaches medical school students in the whole York Medical School, where he is a member of the Centre for Health and Population Sciences. Simon is a leading health sciences researcher and population scientist. His research draws upon his clinical background, having studied psychology before completing his training in medicine, psychiatry and cognitive behavior therapy. Simon was awarded the personal chair in psychological medicine by the University of York in 2008. He takes a population approach to mental health, conducting epidemiological studies, evidence synthesis, and clinical trials to promote effective, efficient, and equitable NHS mental health services. Simon researches in primary care and at the interface between mental and, mental and physical health. Um, Summarise his talk will be around physical activity, mental health and health inequalities. And in it, um, we hope he will focus on physical activity for serious mental health. We, we, he will discuss the drivers for health and health inequalities for people with serious mental illness and place the role of physical activity in this broader context. So thank you very much indeed, Simon, uh, for coming along and agreeing to do this tonight. I will stop sharing uh, my screen. And if you want to share your screen and make a start, that'd be absolutely fantastic. Mark, thank you for that very warm introduction. I'll just um, fiddle around whilst I try to share my screen. Bing. Oh, looks good. We get in there, we get in there. And get this on to slideshow. So Perfect. good evening. Thank you, Simon. From sunny Yorkshire. So like 
Um, lots of people have been sort of drawn into this by the mighty Rob Copeland. So I don't know if that Rob's out in the ether, but um, he might also be on his bike in the um, the the uh, lovely Peak District. So it's a, it's a gorgeous evening here in Yorkshire. Um, I, I, you know, thank you for the warm introduction. I'm particularly chuffed to be here because, you know, the National Centre is such an amazing innovation. And um, the fact that you've got mental health as one of the core themes just warms my heart because um, there are so few of us interested in that interface between mental health and um, physical activity. And I feel like we've got lots to learn, lots of um, road to travel, but um, uh, the goal will be worth it in the end because... Um, um, you know, people with who use mental health services suffer some of the most profound health inequalities. And it's that that I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to think about the contribution to physical activity and um, sedentary behaviour and how we might mitigate that, how we might um, alter the trajectories, how that might contribute to population strategies to improve the health of people who use mental health services. So I'm based at the University of York and i um, um, I have not set foot in my campus for over a year or so now. So um, like lots of people, I'm used to speaking online and hopefully I can keep you interested and entertained for the next 20 minutes. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about health inequalities in severe mental ill health. And I'll sort of like use that Michael Marmot argument about the important drivers of physical health and health inequalities at the population level. And I'll think about how that plays out for the people who have been historically neglected when we think about physical health inequalities, people who use health, mental health services. And I'll, I'll talk about the health and the mortality gap, which is a useful way of thinking about um, health inequalities amongst people who use mental health services. And then um, I'll move into the territory that will be of interest and of relevance to the population to the audience here tonight. And I'll think about exercise and sedentary behavior. How does this contribute to the mortality gap? And um, it's all right observing the world and looking for the associations, but the point's really to change things. So I'm gonna ask the question, what can be done if we're going to move the needle, move the dial to try and um, use exercise-based interventions, physical activity to try and tackle this profound health gap that exists people who use mental health services, how might we go about that? Not hint about some research that's been done so far, but also research that we're hoping to do over the next five years here in Yorkshire, but um, also with collaborators up and down the UK. So there's my Twitter handle. So if you want to say nice things about me or even abuse my, um, my slides there, um, there I am. So it'd be nice to pick up a few more followers this evening. Oh, I can see that's happening already. So thank you, Flo, for the follow. Um, so here we go. Hold on to your seats. I've got a few slides and um, I'm also going to thank in advance, you know, the collaborators who contribute to a really important network that we have in mental health called the Closing the Gap Network. It's an interdisciplinary network where we try to think about the drivers of health inequalities, for people who use mental health services. And I'm particularly thankful to a real pioneer in this area. Dr. Brendan Stubbs, who some of you might know, based down at King's College London, and um, he's had the good grace to um, lend me a few slides for tonight's um, talk. So there we go. So here we've got an interesting slide that comes from a report by Public Health England that I think maps out what the epidemiology of mental health problems looks like in the broader population. So the figure that's often um, trotted out is that one in six of the population will experience mental ill health across their lifetime and at any time. So um, this one in six figure um, is broadly drawn on the, um, uh, the experience of people with common mental health problems like depression and anxiety. When people think about that one in six um, figure, um, they often ignore the other important group of people um, who I'm going to focus on this evening, people with the most severe forms of mental ill health, people who sometimes um, receive diagnosis and labels of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder because it's not as prevalent but um, it's quite life-changing if you were to develop these sorts of um, problems with mental health often in late adolescence and early adulthood and it's not an insubstantial section of the population it constitutes around a half a million people half a million adults in England and this is based on surveys that we do of data collected in GP registries um, and often drawn from data collected alongside the quality and outcomes framework. And um, it's uh, 
uh, a good sampling frame we use to come up with the population estimate. So that half a million um, section of the population is a good number to hang on to when you think about the um, uh, the population burden of the, the, the problems I'm going to talk about just over the next few slides. So this is one of the sort of Michael Marmot slides. The, um, what is it that dictates social gradients in health? Why poor people have poorer health than richer people? And the health inequalities that we observe across the general population, these profound differences in life expectancy and health in the broader population are often draw, driven by the stuff that happens to you earlier on in life. So adverse childhood events and adverse childhood experiences, things like abuse, things like um, uh, being subject and uh, witness to violence and disruptive um, uh, uh, experiences in early childhood are an really important predictor for health later on in life. Um, living in poor housing, living in poverty, experiencing traumatic events, and adverse events across your, your lifetime. And um, the other contributor is very poor working conditions. So um, this is the Michael Marmot story. This is what drives health inequalities in the broader population. And the issue arises when we look at the population of people who use mental health services and have the most severe forms of mental ill health that I've just described, that half a million people on the previous slide. We find that these risk factors for health inequalities are overrepresented for this section of the population. So people who use mental health services and have severe mental ill health are much less likely to um, be in gainful employment, for example, um, more likely to live in um, uh, relative poverty and economic deprivation. They often live in precarious housing and um, often experience social isolation. So these risk factors that we know are bad for your health in the general population are overrepresented amongst people who use mental health services. So again, when I draw from this recent report from um, Public Health England, where they think about how you might mitigate those health inequalities for people who use mental health services, a lot of their strategies center on the social determinants of health. So you think about how you might improve people's employment prospects. You might think about how you ensure that people have good access to benefits. Um, employment support allowance claimants often um, uh, uh, have mental health problems and associated with behavioural problems, how you might mitigate social isolation or how you might try and improve people's housing. But there's very little in there about the lifestyle interventions that will be of particular interest to this audience just now. So um, let's look at what some of the consequences in terms of the health problems that people report and the experience um, of these health inequalities. So here we've got the prevalence of common long-term physical health problems amongst people who use mental health services and have severe mental health compared to comparable sections of the population who don't experience mental health problems. So you can see the prevalence of obesity much, much higher for this population. Respiratory problems like asthma and chronic obstructive airways disease, much higher one and a half, two times higher. So really much higher rates there for, for respiratory illness. And this translates into higher rates of coronary heart disease because obesity is a big problem for this section of the population. Then type two diabetes is also going to be a problem. So this cardiometabolic risk is and um, respiratory risk are some of the big contributors to multimorbidity amongst this population. So again, some figures drawn from the Public Health England report from a couple of years ago. Um, remember I said that people often experience their first episode of severe mental ill health in late adolescence or early adulthood. Well, what's particularly worrying is when you look at the health of people quite early on in their illness trajectories, you see that young people with severe mental ill health are five times more likely to have three or more long-term physical health problems, the prevalence of obesity, asthma, diabetes and hypertension, all too prevalent for this section of the population. So you can see cardiometabolic risk in particular is set in place quite early in people's illness trajectories. And if we had more time, I could say why that might be. Um, but you can see um, things are um, uh, 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 not good quite early on in people's illness experience. And you can see that this sets the scene for physical health inequalities as time progresses. 
So here's an interesting graph. It's one of the graphs that I often show when I talk on this subject. And here we've got two graphs in um, lines in red and blue going in opposite directions. So um, the red dots, the red line are men and the blue dots, the blue lines are um, no, it's the other way around. So the red dots are women and the blue dots are the men. So we've got two lines going in parallel, going upwards. And this plots life expectancy. And it's how it's changed over the last 30 or 40 years. So plotting life expectancy from 1980 all the way up to 2010, which is the last data point that we have for this data set. You can see that the life expectancy of the general population is going up each year and it's flattened off. Um, in recent years, but you can see that there's an upward trajectory of people's life expectancy as preventive medicine and treatment of long term health problems improves. Life expectancy for the broader population has improved. However, it's a very different story for the red and the blue lines that are going in the opposite direction so that we can see over time life expectancy isn't increasing for people with the most severe forms of mental ill health. In fact, life expectancy is decreasing over time. So here we have a manifest health inequality between people who use mental health services and people who don't, and that health inequality is getting bigger over time. So this is a real concern. In fact, I would suggest it's a national scandal, and I'm surprised it doesn't get more attention than it does. But hopefully we can book that trend. So I'll talk about how we might understand how we might mitigate and change the trajectory of this health inequality. So just to summarise where we're at. So why do social factors such as unemployment and poverty drive poor health amongst people with severe mental ill health? Lack of support or access to care. Sometimes the effects of medication, medications that uh, people are prescribed um, for severe mental ill health can have side effects that can cause weight gain. I think this contributes to the um, type 2 diabetes that we see for this population. I'm also going to throw into the mix stigma and discrimination, isolation and exclusion that often prevent people from seeking help. So if people have health problems, the management of those health problems is suboptimal because they don't um, receive preventive strategies, for example. And the next point I would make is something called diagnostic overshadowing. So this is the way in which people's existing physical health problems are not dealt with properly in primary care and in hospital services. It's the misattribution that often happens within health services um, for physical symptoms as part of um, um, services that they receive as a consequence of their mental health diagnosis. So doctors, nurses, people who work in health services sometimes don't take people as in seriously. They don't investigate in the way in which they would do for people who don't use mental health services. And then the final point that I would make is where um, we think we can make a difference when we start thinking about lifestyle approaches because increased rates of behaviours that we know pose a risk to health are um, much more prevalent amongst people who use mental health services. The one that particularly interests me is smoking. It's where I've done most of my research in the recent years, but also poor diet. And the last thing, which I think I'll pick up over the next few slides, this contribution of reduced physical activity and sedentary behaviour inactivity. So here we are. So that's the broad context for health inequalities for people who use mental health services. So I'm going to drill down now on thinking about activity and exercise, and sedentary behaviour, that flip side. So where do we go? So you'll see some names cropping up here. I'm going to talk about some research that helps us think about these things. So the last author there is the person I mentioned right at the beginning of my talk, Dr. Brendan Stubbs. He's a complete ninja in this area and he's a complete machine when it comes to publication. So whenever I want to find out about a topic such as this, I'll just do a Google search on what Brendan's been up to. So Brendan, along with his colleagues, Danny Van Korff and Joseph Firth from the University of Manchester and a few other people there, um, undertook a systematic review to um, uh, look at um, reports of sedentary behaviour and physical activity levels amongst people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, those disorders that we're particularly interested in, and also people with the most severe forms of depression. He's done a systematic review and meta-analysis of all the studies that have been conducted around the world. So um, he pulled all the studies, found 
around 69 studies, so it's a big systematic review, and he shows unambiguously that people with severe mental ill health engage with far less moderate, vigorous physical activity. They display much higher rates of sedentary behaviour. And when you benchmark this against the international recommendations for weekly physical activity, they're only half as likely to meet those um, international recommended standards and levels of physical activity. So if we think about the current focus of treatment amongst people who use mental health services, the mainstay of treatments that people receive are psychotropic medication, the ones that I talk about, antipsychotics, which do have some impact on people's psychological symptoms. Um, there's quite a moderate effect size, but we think that the benefit is um, worth the risk. But the risks are that you are much more likely to put on weight and develop type 2 diabetes. The other thing that's often uh, that is offered is psychological therapy, things like cognitive behaviour therapy, which often has more modest effect size amongst people with the more severe forms of mental ill health, perhaps not quite as effective as it is for people with depression. But for most services, NHS services in this country, I'd suggest, Lifestyle interventions like physical activity are growing importance, and you've got a brilliant talk coming up after me um, where they talk about physical activity programs within the St Andrews Hospital setting, for example. All too often, it's seen as a luxury or of secondary importance. It um, doesn't receive the same prominence as medication and psychological therapy. So here's another one of a um, uh, 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 systematic review that's come from a really excellent group of people, mostly based in Australia, where there's a lot of interest in this topic. And they've looked at physical activity interventions for people with mental ill health and got a systematic review. And again, a meta-analysis. They look for all the randomised controlled trials of interventions to promote physical activity for people with mental illness. And they found about eight trials amongst people with schizophrenia. And they've shown there, when they pool all those studies, they're not huge studies, but it does point in the right direction of an effect size, a standardised mean difference of one standard deviation, standardised mean difference of one, which if you were to benchmark that against the improvements that you might see in psychological symptoms of schizophrenia is pretty good. And it's of an order of magnitude that you might see compared to um, medication and psychological therapy. So this looks like this is heap good medicine why we're not using this a bit, a bit more. So I'll go on again to talk about some of the benefits of physical activity-based interventions. They showed that these trials, when you prove them, improve people's quality of life. They looked at anthropometric measures and also looked at some reductions in depressive symptoms. So it's the gift that keeps on giving is what Brendan would say. So um, not quite, I can't quite see all of this, um, this slide in the title there, but it's something there about um, aerobic exercise and it's a systematic review to look again at the impact on additional symptoms that go alongside schizophrenia so social cognition some cognitive problems like working memory and attention um, these all seem to be improved from um, a similar trial-based data set and um, the factors that seem to be associated with the effectiveness of intervention, it seems to be a dose related thing. So the more exercise that you get people doing, the more benefits that you would accrue from um, this um, trial based data set. And the interesting thing, and Brenda's really keen on this because he's a physiotherapist by background who's got an interest in sports and exercise science. He would say that the qualification of the supervisor, such as being a physiotherapist or accredited sports and exercise therapist, is a really important determinant of engagement and the effectiveness of the intervention. So if you were to think about what some of the biological mechanisms that might drive this um, might be, again, we've got another systematic review from Brendan and his colleagues that's looked not just at psychological symptoms, but has looked at CT scans to see what might be changing there. One of the things that we might look for would be changes in hippocampal volume amongst people with the more severe forms of mental ill health. And he shows that there's a benefit again, and that might explain some of the underlying mechanism of the benefits that accrue in terms of symptom reports. So let's look at um, strategies that you might also recognise the literature on um, interventions to improve levels of cardiorespiratory fitness, again, in people with severe mental ill health. 
So this is a busy slide taken from the abstract of that study. But here's the important thing. The exercise really can improve for this population cardiorespiratory fitness. But the thing is, is people become fitter, but don't necessarily lose weight. So they don't always consistently um, reduce their body mass index in these trial based interventions. So then we've got a bit of a conundrum. And I'd be really interested in people in the audience about how they might understand the fact that people could be fitter, but are still um, quite overweight. So let's think about what we can learn from existing trial based evidence about how we can encourage people to engage and get people to engage optimally with physically based interventions. So, again, um, Brendan and his colleagues have looked at the prevalence and predictors of dropouts from physical activity programs, given that people's level of engagement um, with such interventions might not be all we'd hope. So um, Brendan and his colleagues would say that it's most effective when the programs of activity are individualized and when it focuses on aerobic exercise, where you're encouraging people to engage in more than 12 weeks with moderate to high intensity physical activity. Resistance training seems to work really well for this population. But again, this fact that it's got to be supervised by a professional seems to be really important in predicting uptake and effectiveness. So let's look at the flip side of that. We looked at physical activity. So let's look at sedentary behavior. So um, we can see that sedentary behavior for the, all the interventions that have, um, and associations that have looked at this um, would show that sedentary behavior is associated with much higher rates of all-cause mortality, but cardiovascular disease mortality, cancer mortality, this won't be news to people in today's um, seminar. However, how does that play out, this notion that sedentary behaviour is the new smoking? How does this play out for people who use mental health services? So Australia, um, I've got a really strong message on this. It's like, biggest killer is sitting in your house there. I really like this, all right? The in-your-face way in which Australians describe this thing. So I've learned quite a lot from Australian colleagues in this topic over the years. So let's look at sedentary times amongst people <coughs> who use mental health services. So you can people see that people with the most severe forms of mental health, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, have much have very high levels of sedentary behaviour in terms of the time during each day that they are sedentary. So what can we do about this? I'm nearly to the end of my talk today. Is it possible for people with severe mental ill health to move more? So um, again, here's another systematic review from Brendan and his colleagues, which fed into a really nice intervention that he's piloted with colleagues at the Maudsley Hospital down at King's College London. Walk this way, he's done a pilot study of coaching intervention to reduce sedentary behavior and trying to increase low, low levels of um, uh, low intensity exercise levels in people with severe mental well health. So you've got a protein to undertake in a pilot. Um, so how does this pan out into um, guidelines? Um, well, we've got really strong guidelines from the European Psychiatric Association, for example. Again, Brendan and his colleagues have contributed to that. And their recommendations are that it's high level evidence, the recommendation that we should offer physical activity as a frontline adjunctive treatment to depressive symptoms and also the people with severe mental ill health. And the final recommendation that we'd make there is that people with severe mental ill health should be screened for physical activity habits in primary and in secondary care. Um, so how might we do that? If we try to think about lifestyle interventions amongst people who use mental health services, they rarely, if ever, get asked questions around physical activity or around smoking behaviour, for example, my particular area of interest. So Brenda's got some recommendations. He says that the brief intervention should be the fifth vital sign where you should ask about physical activity. He said that you should ask two questions. It takes no more than a minute. Trying to make every contact count. Keep asking these questions and it'll translate into some offer of a physical activity based behaviour. On average, how many days per week do you engage in moderate to physical, vigorous physical activity like a brisk walk? Always ask your people who um, you, you encounter this question. And the second one, the second question on those days, how many minutes do you engage in average physical activity at this level? So encouraging people to ask these questions and integrate it into um, their routine contacts 
to try and understand how many minutes of physical activity a week and see if they're complying with the guidelines of 150 minutes a week. I'm going to skip through now because um, the summary slide here is that physical activity is a leading cause of years lived with disability and associated with multiple physical health conditions and premature mortality. That's not news for people in today's conversation. Um, but people with severe mental ill health, this you might not have thought about this before, really do engage with very low levels of physical activity and they experience some of the most profound health inequalities of any <clears throat> section of the population. And we think if there was more widely used, then physical activity could work for multiple health outcomes for people with the most severe forms of mental ill health. We've got some strategies that we can use in practice, and this ranges from brief conversations through to referrals to community and specialist services. But I'm going to put my neck out here that um, this feels like lots of areas where we see promising research evidence, and it's not always sufficient to inform practice and policy. Um, you might ask why that, that might be. There is no big killer trial in the United Kingdom that demonstrates that people are going to engage with physical activity and whether that physical activity is going to translate into improved levels of quality of life and might improve people's psychological symptoms. We're still not clear about the how, the when and the who might be for phys activity based interventions in this area. So we thought if we're going to shift the needle, turn the dial, around physical activity, we need a really big trial based in community and mental health services. And the thing for me that's missing with this is the notion of co-production. Co-production is really important. So, um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend the next five years co-producing an intervention, doing a mini-me trial in Yorkshire, and then scaling that up into a much bigger program of research to understand the clinical effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of activity based interventions. I'd really like to tell you more about that, but maybe ask me back in a year or two when we've got some data to speak to. And you've got Ellie speaking at the end of today's day, um, uh, today's seminar, who's going to tell you a little bit more about as her um, uh, being an expert by experience, how she might contribute to a research programme in this area. So we're really excited about work that we're going to do over the next few years. And um, hopefully we can tell you more about that in the next couple of years. So back to you, Mark. Thank you. Simon, thank you very much indeed for that fantastic uh, presentation. Um, as I said at the beginning, for those who just who joined us as Simon was talking, we're going to take um, Q and A uh, together at the end. So I'll say thank you very much to Simon, uh, and I'll move on to our second speaker, um, Dr. Flo Kinnevik. Flo is a, a colleague of mine here at um, Loughborough University, uh, and she's a senior lecturer in psychology. She's a chartered psychologist. of the British Psychological Society and a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Her research employs both quantitative and qualitative methodologies to explore the social, contextual and environmental determinants of physical activity, um, behaviour change, long-term persistence, dropout and lapses, for example. More specifically, she's investigated who and what is perceived as a source of support for behaviour change. This has included facilitating increased quality of motivation using mobile technology, and also investigating the effects of exercise intensity and the physical environment on physiological well-being. She has worked with various population groups, including school-aged youth, employees and mental health service users. And she's going to talk to us today about physical activity in secure mental health settings, uh, where she will discuss ongoing research that provides an overview of the processes and challenges of developing a physical activity intervention in a secure psychiatric setting. Uh, Flo, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you for that introduction as well. I've got an introduction slide, but I don't think I need that anymore. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to the talk. I'm really thrilled to share the floor with Simon as well. And um, hopefully you'll find that our, our talks are complimentary. And actually, it's nice to see that we're on the same page, Simon, um, in what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to tell you about a physical activity intervention that we've been developing in a secure psychiatric service and really focusing on that development, as Simon mentioned, the co-production and to really understand how and why things work or, or don't work is really important. So this is an element that we really wanted to get right. So I'm going to talk about the, the development part of that. I'm going to skip over this. So talking about um, introducing myself um, and my research interests. So it is around the psychosocial determinants of physical activity behaviour and how we can best support those individuals who are insufficiently active to be active um, 
Um, and that's adoption through to uh, sustained physical activity behaviour. And the work that I've been doing with MIND over the last um, seven years or so, and then St Andrew's Healthcare, um, I've more focused this kind of area of research with, um, within the, the field of mental health, so working with people who have mental health problems um, in the community and also in um, the psychiatric services. So, um, before I go into the development of the intervention, I wanted to talk about um, how I come at mental health, if you want. So what, mental health is a complete state. So it's not just an absence of a mental illness or a disorder. So we can be languishing, we can be flourishing, and that can be with um, a diagnosis of mental illness or not. So you can have an individual who has a diagnosis of mental illness, but be flourishing and have good mental health, like the, the definition that WHO uses um, in terms of realising their abilities, coping with normal day to day stresses and working productively. But then you may have uh, somebody who doesn't have a diagnosed mental illness, but they are languishing and they are experiencing mental health problems and they do need support for, for that. Um, so it's a dynamic state and it's important to, to understand we all have mental health and we move through this um, dynamic state uh, throughout our lives, depending on what, what's going on. And those um, factors that Simon mentioned as well. So for today's talk, I'm going to concentrate on individuals who have high levels of mental illness, so severe mental illness and are languishing and who are residing in a, a secure psychiatric setting. So individuals with severe and complex mental illness who pose a risk to themselves and others, they may be detained within a secure psychiatric service under the Mental Health Act of 1983. And within a service, uh, patients will have 24 hour nursing care, be under a multidisciplinary team, which is led by a, a, a clinical psychiatrist, usually or another profession, uh, a clinician as their responsible cl uh, clinician. Uh, patients will receive uh, an assessment, treatment and rehabilitation within this environment and then have often have access to leisure facilities, uh, occupational facilities and sometimes uh, facilities within the community as well. So there's approximately 6,000 individuals with severe mental illness who are residing in low, medium and high secure units. Um, and in the UK, there's currently 57 medium secure, three high secure forensic inpatient using units. So the high secure is your, your Rampton, Broadmoor and Ashworth. So this is predominantly forensic inpatients. So those with the most severe um, mental illness, but also who pose the, the biggest threat to, to being outside in the community. And the average length of stay um, in one of these units is between 18 and 24 months, although it's not uncommon for individuals to stay longer. So the work we've been doing with St Andrews, some individuals come in for an assessment um, are there for three months. Others have been there for over a decade and they will be there for, for a long time. So although this is average, it certainly does change. So I think this... Um, uh, echoes really kind of what Simon was saying about individuals who have severe mental illness um, uh, experiencing up to a 20 year premature mortality. And this is largely due to the physical health inequalities that Simon talked about. So individuals with severe mental illness are more likely to be obese, overweight, more likely to smoke, more likely to eat poorly, engage in risky behaviours. And this is makes them more susceptible to those metabolic and cardiovascular diseases. And this is um, further exacerbated by um, antipsychotic medication, um, which is in, associated with rapid increase in, in weight and BMI and a variety of other physical health consequences. And particularly kind of in a, a secure environment where the symptoms are at the most severe, illness is at its most severe and on admission where these um, medications are, the doses are at their highest. This is kind of further exacerbated. So those physical health inequalities um, that we've discussed, they can be helped by um, lifestyle interventions such as physical activity. And those who have mental illness do stand to gain from engaging in activity. However, as we've seen in the previous talk, um, these individuals do engage in significantly less physical activity and significantly more um, sedentary behavior. And again, in a secure setting, 
um, where movement is restricted and it can be restricted even further if you're on legal grounds, if you're a forensic patient. Um, this is exacerbated and those, those environments are termed abusogenic because of um, the culture of sedentary behaviour. So we collected some de um, device assessed uh, daily physical activity data uh, through accelerometry on the wards and we found that uh, patients were engaging in 775 minutes on average of stationary um, activity um, and this is in waking time so that's equivalent to about 12 hours so a, a part of that waking day 12 hours they're huge amounts of sedentary behavior um, that we need to target and as we mentioned there's considerable physical and mental health benefits for those individuals um, to engage in physical activity of lots of different intensities, duration uh, and modes as well of physical activity. So I'm going to no name drop Brendan Stubbs, I think his ears are going to be burning today. Um, so in 2018 I worked with Brendan and colleagues to um, produce the, uh, the European Psychiatric Association guidance on physical activity as treatment for uh, those with severe mental illness and this was accompanied by um, recommendations, both clinical practice, as Simon mentioned, and also um, research recommendations, which is kind of what I'll focus on today. So there is good evidence that physical activity can be used as a treatment for severe mental illness with mild and moderate depression, and also as an adjunct to schizophrenia and spectrum disorders. And there's also reasonable evidence now that physical activity um, should be used to address the physical health outcomes of um, patients with severe mental illness um, and try and kind of reach that parity of esteem that physical health is as important as mental health because there is that kind of a lack of focus um, within the mental health services. So in terms of the work that we've been doing, we've been um, trying to address those research recommendations that came from this paper um, in 2018, looking on focusing on the implementation and the culture in clinical practice specifically. So there's really an importance to establish pragmatic scalable methods that can be used um, large scale um, for delivering physical activity as, as a treatment. So we, what the intervention that I'm going to mention is that we designed an online interactive module aimed at ward staff in these um, secure services to support them to promote movement. When I say movement, it's because we want to increase physical activity, but we want to decrease sedentary behaviour. And that incidental physical activity on the ward um, could be kind of a real key part of, of what we're trying to do. So the Medical Research Council and the National Institute for Health Research commissioned a paper on, on guidance to uh, specifically on the development of complex interventions. And I really wanted to highlight this because um, this is what is, is lacking in our understanding, um, particularly with mental illness, is um, what works for who um, and why does it work? And the inadequate development and certainly the uh, transparency of, of the development of an intervention when we don't know what's been used, why it's been used, um, can lead to ineffective interventions and be a real waste of money. Um, and what we, we wanted to get this bit right because what we didn't want to do was helicopter into a setting that we didn't fully understand um, and then propose an intervention that uh, didn't consider the context and the issues of face, we didn't understand the implementation challenges or those facilitators that we could actually lean on within, within these settings. So uh, this was a, a really important um, part of the, the development of an intervention process. So the first bit, reviewing the existing evidence. Um, so two of our systematic scoping reviews that you can see on the right hand side and um, the information that came out was really clear that there's a real lack in terms of intervention evaluation. And um, so what works for who? Why does it work? When does it work? When does it does it not work? And what are those um, mechanisms of change or um, active ingredients, if you want, within interventions and why are they being used? And there was um, also what came out was low recruitment and also low adherence. But because of this lack of intervention evaluation, it was difficult to understand whether this was because of the poor um, delivery and it, or an intervention wasn't delivered as it was intended, or was it just that the intervention didn't work? 
so that is something that's really important and I, I guess why my talk is really trying to be transparent about how are we developing an intervention there's also staff involvement which is really crucial across all um of uh, of the interventions that we reviewed and how staff can uh, can be a real facilitator but also a barrier to um people engaging in physical activity but there's a real lack of education of those staff and lack of expertise uh, of those staff that were involved also there was a lack of underpinning psychological theory um, so providing that rationale so why were components within the intervention used and what were those mechanisms of change and how are they going to be measured um, across time to understand um, why a change has come about and also importantly i think inadequate data collection methods um, so patients were often engaged in really lengthy interviews or burdened with long um, uh, surveys, which were at times difficult to understand. Some of the validated scales might not be appropriate for the, this population group um, and relied on recall or self-report, which um, when the illness is at its most severe or symptoms are at their most severe, um, it might not be as accurate um, to have that recall element. So also what we engaged in um, to understand the context um, and how a real world intervention might be implemented in this unique context. So Eva Rogers, who is a recently completed PhD student of mine um, working in St Andrews. So she engaged in over 300 hours at St Andrews over a 12 month period. Um, and she was uh, kept a reflective diary in that time and documented her thoughts, her feelings, um, and also logistical implications of um, carrying out research in this environment. Um, and I think it's important to, she, she spoke with the uh, multidisciplinary team, she spent time on the wards, she was involved in the psychotherapy, um, the exercise session, meal time, so kind of all the, the different aspects, um, the community meetings, um, all the different aspects within St Andrews. I think it's important to note that this immersive work is really time consuming, so it was part of Eva's PhD, so we were able to do it. It is time consuming but it does really support that deep and nuanced um, insight, which is unavailable through different um, um, methods. I think health intervention work that, that draws on immersive work rather than the traditional and, and sometimes tokenistic patient public involvement it is really better equipped to produce those effective um, strategies. And it's great that if you can engage in, in PPIs so patient public involvement and have focus groups to understand the context, that's 100% better than not doing it. Um, but to immerse yourself in a context um, and to really understand what's going on um, is really insightful. So as well as documenting um, and then addressing kind of the un unconscious bias that we may possess and the stigma associated with um, mental illness and institute secure institutions. This um, time that Eva spent was undoubtedly essential um, to the ongoing purpose of secure services um, and the day-to-day -day lives of patients and staff. Um, the consistency, the visibility that Eva had and the continuity elements that we know were really important to build a rapport and trust of patients were invaluable for the recruitment um, to subsequent studies as well. And something that we've really noticed through COVID when we haven't been able to go into the hospital is um, and trying to engage patients online. Very difficult and we've really struggled for that. So building that rapport and understanding is, is super important. Also in terms of practically the logistics of um, devices, I'm just thinking about the accelerometry devices that we were um, using this process of finding appropriate and safe devices was lengthy. We had to go through several departments, um, engage in understanding of the, the security um, elements, and also speaking with the clinicians who are responsible in terms of who might be able to wear those devices. Um, and then the device itself, so staying away from the, the waste worn with the straps, which may, with the, um, the long straps, which have a, a danger for self-harm um, with a risk of becoming a ligature. So we went with the wrist worn uh, Genie Active accelerometer, which you couldn't take apart. And that was all approved. So all those things, being able to immerse yourself in the context, saved us a lot of time, taught us an awful lot um, in, that, in, in that time. So 
I think that's a really important and kind of goes along what Simon was saying in terms of co-producing and uh, these interventions. And so two further uh, papers, uh, studies that we, we did qualitative in terms of trying to understand the physical activity experiences and also perceptions of uh, uh, implementing a physical activity intervention in these contexts. So we interviewed healthcare assistants, which is the, the staff, the ward staff that we wanted to target as part of this, uh, this intervention. So those individuals who were on the ward um, with the patients, they understood the individual needs of the patients and they had that rapport as well. So how could they promote physical activity on the wards? Um, and then also patients, obviously, getting insight into the patient's experiences was really important. So the healthcare assistants, they viewed exercise as multi-beneficial to patients. And they, interestingly, they were discussing how it could provide a normalizing effect. So it could be an activity that um, patients would engage in, which wasn't about their mental illness, it wasn't about therapy, that they could, they could be anywhere doing it. You know, it could be something that they would carry on doing um, after they were um, discharged from the hospital. But it also carried that therapeutic treatment and that they did um, see improvements to mental health symptoms to those people who were regularly active. Um, and throughout those interviews, we um, saw how uh, they, we could have barriers to, to engaging with these individuals and how, and certainly considerations that we needed to, to make in terms of this online module and what, what they needed to know. Um, so there was very much an organisational culture of uh, physical activity, but sedentary behaviour, whereas staff... Um, admitted that they preferred it when patients were sat around not doing anything because they felt that the ward was safer, they felt that the ward was more in control if nobody was moving. Um, so that's a difficult one to, to address. And the, also the inconsistent staff buying of whose responsibility was it to promote physical activity. So as in their um, job description, promoting well-being was part of their job description, the physical activity element didn't necessarily sit within what they felt that their, um, their responsibility. Part of that was confidence of knowing what to do, but also um, given that responsibility to the physical activity and exercise therapy team, which scheduled sessions, which were very much timetabled. So that incidental and spontaneous physical activity is not able to fit with, with that team. And it also differs in terms of perceptions of the strategies that could be used um, for behaviour change. So thinking about informal conversations on the wards about how people can engage um, in exercise and encouraging that versus more compulsory interventions where patients are required to engage in physical activity as part of their treatment. But then obviously that kind of contradicts a little bit in terms of the normalising effect, taking it away from the therapy. So there's lots, of, uh, lots for us to think about in that. And then the patients highlighted um, how uh, there's a lot of issues with motivation in terms of um, the, the symptoms could uh, interact with their motivation to exercise. Also, those unwanted side effects of medication, kind of the lethargy, weight gain, um, which particularly impacted on self-confidence and self-esteem to, to engage in physical activity. And then there was that idea of whether exercise was holistically beneficial. So certainly it was there was collective agreement that there was a relief from mental health symptoms when you were engaging in physical activity. But it was a bit of a double-edged sword in terms of those individuals who are experiencing manic symptoms and how exercise sometimes could um, exaggerate those symptoms. So I think what is um, important to understand that physical activity is not necessarily a, a panacea, to, to cure mental illness, but it certainly should be used as part of a toolkit of support uh, for these individuals. There's an interesting paper by um, Tony Williams, who, who talks about how exercise is not necessarily good for everybody all of the time. And I think it's good to acknowledge that, understand that, and when it is good for people and, and try to hone that. And um, I'm thinking here for the manic symptoms, but also uh, understanding eating disorders as well. So some just things that, to be, uh, to acknowledge and think about. And then again, staff came up um, really as a key in terms of a barrier and facilitator to exercise. So access, whether there was enough staff. So if an incident happened and staff were called away, there was no one to escort them to, to take part in any exercise, which individuals in secure settings have to be uh, escorted, sometimes two or three staff members to one person. So 
a, a lot of logistical considerations here and then con conflicting and inconsistent attitudes which uh, supported some of our earlier evidence as well in terms of the need for education for the staff and understanding their attitudes to try and um, change them. So given that motivation was a problem and we wanted to um, implement a theoretical framework that was accessible to the staff that provided practical recommendations that they could use. So we underpinned um, our work with self-determination theory, which is a, a macro theory of motivation. And this theory focuses on the quality of motivation rather than the quantity of motivation. And um, it can provide uh, guidance on behaviours and also content of supportive communication um, of how HCAs can promote autonomous motivation rather than controlled motivation. So when I talk about controlled motivation, I'm talking about um, when an individual feels that they have to do something and they may, perhaps they've been told to by one of their medical team that they, they have to, to exercise, but they don't want to, they don't see any value in it, etc. So what we want to do is move those individuals or help the HCAs to have these conversations of how to facilitate that autonomous motivation to get people to see the value in the exercise themselves, whether it's the mental health, the physical health, the social element, and that the, the individual can see the value. And then ultimately what's kind of the real goal is that intrinsic motivation where people love doing exercise for exercise itself, which isn't always, um, it's a difficult one to achieve within physical activity and exercise interventions for those who don't exercise regularly. Um, but that's kind of what, we, what we're we driving towards because, you know, uh, if you love something that you're more likely to do it, we, if, you, if anything that you love doing it, you want to do it again and again. Um, so this was the um, theoretical framework that we had. So we worked with um, the learning and development team at St Andrews and finalised the prototype. Um, it was reviewed by experts in the field of mental health, self-determination theory, and also the exercise therapist team um, at St Andrews. And this is kind of the, the front page of this online module um, that we produced. So a couple of kind of elements of that online module. The first section of the module aim to improve knowledge and um, provide information of exercise for um, severe mental illness and also some of the consequences of inactivity. And then we also included some of that qualitative work for the benefits of um, uh, patients that experienced, so patients from the wards, we could kind of put in how they felt about the exercise as well to, do, to bring that, that element to life. Um, and then we talked about how, the role of the, the healthcare assistant, the, the role that they could play in promoting physical activity. And then the next section uh, was underpinned by self-determination theory and it outlines the theory, the importance of behavior change and also provided examples of how the HCAs could adopt um, this kind of approach if you want. Um, and this was using interactive kind of scenario based um, components to, uh, to the module. So we had collected all the baseline measures and we were about to start the feasibility trial when COVID hit and everything went wrong and we weren't able to do that um, as we went into lockdown. Um, so since policy has changed in St Andrews in that they've embedded this online module which is now compulsory for all new and existing staff and they've had over 900 completions which is amazing. So what we're going to do, I'll talk about next steps very quickly shortly and what we need to do is understand the impact of this module and um, how has the impact of making it a compulsory part of staff um, and their roles um, in terms of culture change um, and whether staff have, have taken on any of those behaviours. So kind of taking you to some concluding remarks then um, and a bit about the next steps that we're aiming to do. So following that MRC guidance, we developed the online module, um, which was aimed at ward staff to support them in physical activity promotion. We aim to address some of those research recommendations from the European Psychiatric Association um, and sort knowledge from the individuals and the environment um, themselves to really best meet the needs of the patients, uh, the, the staff and also the organisation. So the next steps then, there is a lack of feasibility studies in mental health care. I think we've both talked about that. So the next logical step is to test the efficacy of the intervention and understand the impact of this online module. And what we're hoping to do is also go beyond this, this online module and develop a toolkit that both patients and, um, patients and staff can input 
and use day to day um, when promoting physical activity or engaging with physical activity from the patients. And then some work that we're currently doing at the moment, which may be able to refine some of the interventions um, is trying to understand the associations with incidences and physical activity. So this came from some of our qualitative work, which um, indicated that there may be an association with physical activity and incidences. So we've got, um, I think, nine months of data in terms of incidences, time stamped, uh, and that's aggressive incidences outwardly and also self-harm with physical activity, time stamped as well. Um, and also we've got data from over 700 patients uh, their BMI measures from admission to discharge, I think over the last three decades. So trying to understand that the BMI trajectories within the hospital setting, looking at age, um, at sex, diagnosis, and also medication. Um, and from that, we can refine the interventions, but also could we um, uh, prioritise interventions potentially on admission uh, to try and identify those individuals with those characteristics who might be more susceptible to those physical health um, complications and uh, perhaps kind of target, have an early intervention with those individuals. Um, so that's kind of it um, in terms of uh, the secure setting, but I think it's really important this is a real unique context and the learning that we're getting um, from our the work that we're doing, I think is transferable also and interesting for other um, other contexts as well. So people living with severe mental illness in the community, often and under a community mental health team. So can those mental health nurses who we know are being um, encouraged to think about the physical health of their patients, can they use some of this information? And then also within other secure services. And the obvious one is within prisons where we know that there's a, a, a large amount and increasing mental health problems. So can any of this um, information be used uh, within those settings as well. So that's it from me. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've been able to take something from, from the talk and I look forward to um, some questions shortly. Thank you very much indeed, Flo, that was great. Um, for our final uh, speaker this evening, I'm hoping to um, introduce Ellie Wildbore to you all. Um, Ellie works between the medical education and research teams at the University of Hull, using her lived experience in mental health to aid her role as a patient research ambassador. She's a qualified primary school teacher, but has also worked and volunteered in mental health organisations and support roles as an occupational therapy assistant in teaching and research. She currently teaches on the clinical psychology course at the University of Hull, works for the Royal College of Psychiatrists as a peer reviewer for therapeutic communities, and is involved with training staff both in Sheffield Health and Social Care NHS Foundation Trust and further afield, such as with the police, railway staff and Sheffield teaching hospital staff. She also runs workshops and speaks at conferences about her experiences. And she's going to share with us today her personal experience of physical activity and mental health through her lived experience. She will talk about how developing a love of roller skating has transformed, transformed her mental health, helped develop her social networks and have benefits for her physical health. Ellie, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, hi, it's really it's really nice to be here and I'm hoping to, I guess, it's been really interesting listening to the previous two speakers um, and I'm hoping, I guess, to put a bit of a sort of um, uh, all, that into, all that theory into like a real life context for, for you. Um, so a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm someone who's had um, significant mental health problems for a majority of my life. I'm 33 now and was um, first diagnosed at 17 although in real re real realistically I probably had mental health problems going back way before that um, and um, particularly in the last decade or so I've spent a lot of time in and out of hospitals um, um, both like uh, mental health hospitals and uh, general hospitals um, because I had a very high level of self-harm and suicidality um, and um, have been one of those people that's been counted off by the system many times. She's never going to recover. She's never going to live fully independently. Um, uh, and um, I'm not cured by any means. I still struggle with mental health problems every day. Um, going through a bit of a wobbly patch now, I'm not going to lie. Um, but 
uh, my life has also changed a lot um, in the past couple of years um, for the better. And I found some of those things that have have helped me to to kind of like latch on to the the real world um, and kind of pull my keep pulling myself forward even when I fall back backwards. Um, so yeah, I um, physical activity for me has been a massive part of of that process in getting to into a better place and and most significantly a safer place um, because I spend a, a lot of my time not being a, a safe person um, in terms of risk towards myself. Um, which also inadvertently can, can cause risk, risk to others when I'm really unwell. Um, and physical activity has been one of those huge factors in, in increasing my in increasing my safety, uh, which has in turn helped me then be able to engage with other things like start to work again and do things like this, um, which have also been been massive for me. Um, so I um, I've had a complicated relationship with physical activity throughout my life. Like I was. Um, I was a child who was brought up in a in a in a kind of like overachieving area where everybody like went on to university to become doctors and lawyers and this that and the other um I got BBC um, A level and that was considered a failure in the school that I went to so just to put that into context um a lot of I think like eight of my close friends went to Oxbridge so everything was very sort of like the, the the top is the best and even though I was kind of probably but above average I felt very very much low and that included things like sports and stuff like that I was very I remember PE at school being something I was absolutely terrified about because you know I wasn't in a sports team I wasn't I didn't have a scholarship to this place that uh, with um playing particular sports and things like that and people around me did so it was something that I was very conscious of I've also struggled with an eating disorder, um, which is probably my longest running mental health problem. Um, and so my relationship with exercise was very much like I need to do this in order to, to lose weight and, and came very, very mixed up with my eating disorder. And I didn't really understand the context of doing exercise for fun. Um, so as a youth, my run-ins with exercise were very much sort of either around the overachieving side. Um, I did swim uh competitively when I was younger um um or it was to do with my eating disorder and kind of mixed in around that so it was something that was kind of very it wasn't a particularly positive influence in my life it wasn't anything that was that was a big thing for me um and it wasn't probably until um it kind of happened in stages I think where I sort of started finding this a thing that might be helpful and and all of those stages actually started somehow when I was in um, either a hospital or um, uh, in one case in a day service setting um, where I started discovering things. Um, I'd spent a lot of years thinking that I should be doing, you know, I should be going to the gym, I should be going for runs, all of that sort of stuff um, and really absolutely hating every minute of it. Um, I think if I was someone who didn't have an eating disorder, then I probably wouldn't have done it. But because I had an eating disorder, there was some drive to try and do that. But I hated it. It was horrible. Um, and then when I got when I became unwell um, with my general mental health, I would just lie in bed for days, not do anything. I also had a lot of um, times when I was physically unable to do stuff because of the amount of injury I caused myself. Um, uh, like I to put things into context, I would have like up to 200 A&E admissions a year for self-harm. I was on crutches a lot, caused a lot of like permanent damage to my legs. And in fact, at one point I was told I was very, very close to not being able to walk and I probably would never have like normal nerve function in my legs again. Um, good news is that actually being more physically active and getting really, really like used to my body um, and how it um, and and reteaching re re it to use its nerves I actually have had a lot of positive effect on my nerve damage uh, through through being more physically active um, but that's a bit of a flash forward um so um I actually first came across something that I enjoyed doing when I was I was in an eating disorders day service and there was a girl who was really obsessed with like circus stuff and she brought in some hula hoops and I could never do hula hooping when I was a kid um it wasn't something I could ever do and it also was very felt very much like a thing where your body was kind of the center of the thing and that wasn't okay for me um 
but she had like a a, a proper hoop and she t- she said oh come on give it a go and I can tell you how to do it um uh, thank you for the the comments that people have put in the chat by the way that's really really nice um she she gave me a go and I could actually do it and I thought this is kind of quite fun and I went along with her to the hooping classes um and um I think initially I was still very much driven by my eating disorder in terms of 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 feeling that I should be doing something um but it was something that I found that I really enjoyed I started to become more proficient at it uh, it's quite a dancey sort of art which is not ever something that I've ever done um uh, and it kind of became it started to become a way of expressing myself um if I was feeling like sad I could put a sad song on and dance to that with my hoop um if I was feeling like I needed to let some energy out I'd like put an, an energetic song on um so that was kind of the first bit but it was a very sort of like small thing and it was kind of just a, a glimpse of physical activity maybe being useful but I think it was still very much marred by my general mental health my repeated physical condition because of that um and also the just how unwell I was I was regularly in hospital I didn't have access to that sort of thing um and then things really started to change for me. I was fortunate enough to be um, sent to a, a therapeutic community in an inpatient hospital in York um, called The Retreat. People might have heard of it. Um, it's unfortunately closed now, but it was one of the original um, psychiatric hospitals that wasn't an asylum in the UK. Um, and there ethos as a hospital was because it was built on Quaker principles it was very much about um community it was about the environment it was about activity together it was about animals all that sort of thing and so that was very much encouraged there um and what actually happened is one day um someone um who I knew in York took me out to a roller disco and I had had rollerblades when I was a kid. I um, hadn't really had another go, but I, I I loved it. And a couple of us went and got hold of some roller skates and um, we had access to a hall in the hospital. And we'd go up there after group. We'd have groups all day until about six o'clock. Um, and it might be a really, really tough day on the unit. We might be all fighting with each other um, or like not having a good day. But we'd go up um, to this hall with our roller skates after group and just skate it out and originally the hospital's um thing on it was like oh my god like we can't have them roll <laughs> whizzing around the corridors on roller skates what about health and safety what about this that and the other but actually when we kind of gave up our, our, our points towards why we should be allowed to do that we were pointing out that actually um yeah there was a health and safety issue but all of us had significant issues with self-harm and other sort of self-defeating behaviours. Um, and by doing this, we were not doing that. Um, and so they did let us um, start to do that. And that became something that I very much used, started to use as a sort of a way to like just let everything out. Um, and when I came back to Sheffield, where I live now, um, which was a city that I'd left my life in tatters, um, um, I a lot of I, I didn't really do anything apart from self-harm and be ill before I left and my um, social circles were other people who were in that situation so some quite negative relationships um, uh, kind of a lot of toxic stuff going on um, but when I came back I was able to use the bit of skating sort of that I'd learned in the hospital to be like how is that something I can do here? Is that something I can continue? Um, and it took quite a bit of work to find them, but I, I eventually started skating again and making new friends and making new contacts in back in my home city that were positive contacts. Um, and that was through skating. And now um, I'm four years out of that hospital admission now. Um, I am very involved in skating in the city, do a lot of, of stuff in terms of trying to like um, increase increase people on skates. Um, I'm, I actually discovered the best form of skating for me was, um, I'm talking quad skates, like the old fashioned quad roller skates, but taking those in a skate park and throwing myself off big ramps on wheels. Um, and I think the thing that I discovered that, um, for, for me I've been told so many times in my in my life like can't you just replace self-harm with something um draw on your 
arm in red pen twang an elastic band hold an ice cube and none of that touched the sides for me I have a history of trauma there was a lot of stuff I was dealing with by doing self-harm and at that point in time that was the best way I had of dealing with it um and one of the things that skating and other physical activities because I've actually got into just being active in general through this because once you get to a certain point it kind of becomes addictive um uh it, what the things that skating gave me is it gave me um that physical outlet like kind of quite, quite aggressive I had quite an aggressive sort of side of me which was kind of inwardly um you know aimed at myself in terms of self-harm and things like that but I could get that out on skates I was meeting new people I was learning new things like every day I had this different relationship with my body something that had been a cumbersome thing that I hated there was like nothing I liked about it I didn't see the benefits of having a body I would have quite happily not had a body if that was an option um suddenly it's being able to do these cool tricks and handstands on the edge of a ramp and jumping over boxes and and I started appreciating it for what for what it could do and that was a really big turning point for me because one of the things that obviously I don't want to do is hurt it more so that I can't skate and I can't do these things and so I'm not by any means um like sorted in terms of self-harm and things like that um but to put into context as I said before I went to the hospital I was having like 200 admissions to any &E a year last year I had four um and that's a massive massive reduction and a lot of that has been to do with finding this sort of thing this thing that really made me tick and I think one of the most important things for me is realizing that actually one of the things that I needed in my life and this is a bit controversial but I needed a kind of sense of danger a sense of risk there was something uh, about that aspect of of self-harming about suicidal behavior that that did something for me and skating provides a more socially acceptable and less damaging to me and everybody else um way of getting that risk yes it is a risky sport um I have hurt myself I've been concussed in fact I'm recovering from cushion right, concussion right now um I've got had some very very gnarly bruises uh, like the whole size of my side of my thigh and things like that but it's it's kind of like I'm I'm doing that in a positive way instead of if I wasn't doing that I would definitely be hurting myself in other ways um but by skating I, I might hurt myself but as time's gone on actually I'm less likely to hurt myself because I've learned that I've learned how to fall and that's been a massive thing for me in my life is um learning how to fall in life and how to get back up again like skating involves a lot of falling anybody who knows what skating is at all will understand that people um uh, fall a lot of skating it's often something that people are scared about are scared about but I'm not scared of falling anymore and I think that's also translated over into my life um uh in learning to get back up in skating and learning from my mistakes I'm learning to do that in life so I do fall I do fall regularly I've fallen in the past couple of weeks but I'll never fall quite as deep because I've learned how to how to get back up again um so yeah I think for, for I just like uh, for me I want to advocate that um physical activity can be a life changing thing it can be a life saving thing I'm not being over dramatic when I say that physical activity changed my life um I've gone from someone who was just in hospital all the time to someone who skates someone who cycles someone who does hooping who does acro balance and is just generally active and and loving it um and I think it's about what's finding that thing as as Florence and said it's it's the thing that ma makes people love it and it makes them tick and that's more likely to make them do it um so it's not always about thinking you know run of the mill going to the gym doing a football match like that might be great for people but sometimes it's thinking outside of the box it might be circus activities it might be climbing it might be roller skating who knows um so yeah thank you for letting me speak that's my story <laughs> Ellie, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm, uh, that, that was hugely inspiring and, and you delivered it so beautifully. So thank you so much for telling us about your experience. I mean, uh, you generated a huge amount of chat in, in, in the chat box, uh, but everybody just basically saying um, how, how great it is to hear, hear you speak, but also um, to hear you relate to the things that we've been talking about in a much more academic sense earlier to really bring it to life for us. So thank you so much 
for that. It's really, really appreciated. And, and um, yeah, I could listen to you all day. So thank you. That was fantastic. No worries. Um, we've got a little bit of time. I'm conscious it's 25, 23 minutes past seven in the evening. Um, and we're due to wrap up uh, at, at half past. So we've got the time for a few questions uh, over the next five minutes or so. So, But uh, as you understand, um, I don't want to keep people uh, from their evening activities. So we'll keep it pr pretty short and sweet. Um, so if there are any questions, um, please can you drop them into, into the Q&A. Um, while you're thinking about it, I did have something just to, I don't know, guess more of a, a reflection, really. Um, Simon, you, you said, um, you know, in Australia, um, sit, don't sit in your house. I think that's what you said. Um, and then we talked about, Flo talked about, um, you know, activity and il illness. Um, COVID-19, the last year, um, we know there's been an increase in uh, report increase in mental health issues, um, at least some of the things I've seen anyway. I'm no expert, as you know, in this, but I, I've seen that. And we also know that from the first lockdown, there was an average increase in physical activity, according to, to the figures. Uh, and, and as you all know, that, you know, someone sedentary doing anything has a huge positive impact on their physiological and, and um, psychological health. Um, we know in the last lockdown from January to March or whatever, the, 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 the most lockdown part, actually that decreased quite significantly. So I guess I'm just asking you guys to comment on that situation. And, and are we backing up a huge uh, a mental health issue problem in the next six months, one year? Uh, and what can we do about it? Big question, I know. But while people are thinking, I just wanted to get your views on that, really. I don't know if Simon wants to start or flow or perhaps nobody. <laughs> Shall I set the ball rolling? Because I think it's a really interesting observation, Mark. So, um, you know, most of the news and the discussions around the impact of COVID has focused on an epidemic of mental ill health that we're um, expecting. So, um, and some of the population surveys have borne that out and we know that the higher levels of loneliness, social isolation, potentially um, greater numbers of people depressed and anxious, particularly young people. However, the bit that people don't really talk about is what the impact of this has been among people with pre-existing mental health problems. So rather than thinking about the new epidemic of mental ill health in the broader population, how has this impacted on people who use mental health services? And very few of the surveys have looked at that. Fortunately, before the pandemic um, hit, there um, we, we'd been we'd recruited ten thousand people to a cohort. Um, 10,000 people with the most forms of severe forms of mental ill health. And we've got some baseline data on what their health related behaviours might be. Um, levels of physical activity, a little bit about diet, the use of alcohol um, and how much they were smoking as well. So um, so the health benefits that you report, Mark, for the broader populations, so people going out more, taking a bit more exercise, have not really been translated into any health gain for the section of population with severe mental ill health so quit for covid which was a big thing in the smoking cessation community not really happened for people who use mental health services in fact um people who were smoking before are now smoking more heavily than they were so we've been able to track that during the pandemic for people with severe mental ill health um much more sedentary um lives levels of sedentary behavior so people were sedentary before pandemic hit people with severe mental ill health higher levels of sedentary behaviour um, for our sections of the population. So we think that pre-existing inequalities and health risk behaviours um, have been amplified amongst people who use mental health services. So um, my concern is that um, this health inequality is not going to go away after the pandemic. In fact, it might be worse than when it started. So I think that's a priority for, for services just at the minute. I'm sure Flo's got some thoughts on that. And Ellie, you know, be really interested to hear her thoughts on that. Yeah, I think um, kind of in a, an acute sense, so I mentioned at the end, uh, we've got some data about uh, incidences, um, aggressive incidences outwardly and self-harm as well, and time stamp with... that's worrying and how um, you can address that when you're not able to access those facilities or within the services yourself um, and really stuck in in small like whole wards on in isolation 
and because of COVID in hospital. So yeah, I, I'd agree that um, it's going to need some big efforts, I guess. Thanks, mm. Ellie. You've got anything to add? Yeah, I guess I echoing what those these guys just said. I think there's there's a lot of there's a lot more talk about mental health just in general at the moment because it's just it's become a thing that people have noticed more because of the pandemic. Um, but what people are forgetting is there was a good proportion of us already with mental health problems, also then having to deal with the the problems caused by the pandemic. Um, and I get a lot of people saying, "Oh, well, you know, that last year was difficult for all of us." Yes, it was. And I'm not I'm not belittling anyone's experience, but having to suddenly, um, you know, manage that and manage mental illness, um, which is probably on a very fine balance beforehand is, is difficult. But on the on the other hand, there's certain aspects of the pandemic that some people with mental health uh, health problems are actually quite good at dealing with. Like I'm quite used to dealing with suddenly not being able to see my friends and family because that's happened to me a lot. I'm quite used to having my my uh, liberties restricted somewhat. It's happened a lot. So I was one off, I guess, on, uh, on some of my aspects. So every cloud has a silver lining, I guess. <laughs> interesting way to a positive flow can i just add to that thanks ellie it's really nice to see you as well ellie um i know i've worked with you on the mind uh, yeah. work so um uh, with mine so i've just been um evaluating this sector support program so um supporting mental health within the sport and physical activity sector and kind of thinking about silver lining of covid i'm uh, um trying to look for that but there has definitely been an acceleration of consideration of mental health within the sector. So there's a lot more conversation, a lot more informal practices within organisations who are um, putting mental health as, at the top of an agenda in a meeting, like how are you, that being the first part of the, the conversation. Um, so certainly looking after employees has uh, within the sector has um, accelerated. And I think it, it's definitely part of COVID how it was normalizing the conversation about mental health because everybody was talking about it so um that is a positive in terms of uh, the, the sports sector specifically thanks um we I, i'm conscious that it's half seven but there are a couple of quick questions um i'd like to throw out there so um one for ellie um do you have any tips for health professionals and how to help those with um with mi to find the activity that floats their boat um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm kind of doing a, little, a, bit, a bit of work about this in, in, in Sheffield, sort of that uh, helping helping professionals to help people find those things, um, not just in physical activity, but also in like other social connections. Um, and I think I think one of the things and I can find this quite frustrating, actually, um, and I understand why people do it, but a lot of professionals come in and they, they're like, have you tried yoga? Like I've tried yoga and I find yoga really, really helpful um, and start putting that all on you. And then you feel quite pressured, like, oh, I have to try this thing that this person's found helpful. And then when you don't find it helpful, you kind of feel a little bit awkward about it. And um, so I think it's more about um, kind of keeping a bit of an open mind and kind of like exploring with that person what sort of things um you know are are they interested in are they somebody who who maybe likes being outdoors is is that something that that you know do they sit in their garden a lot when they're sedentary whether maybe you can think about outdoor activities um is you know what sort of like it, there's, there's other things as well like you know for example um you know when pokemon go was a big thing um and suddenly like all these people who would normally be sat behind their computer just gaming were going out and meeting other people who were playing this so it's, it's sometimes it's just been a bit inventive about it thinking outside the box find like find what makes that person tick um have just open conversations not like going in with a closed sort of like well there's you know there's this thing you could try or there's this thing you could try like just just keep it keep it open look for clues in that person's personality as well um yeah i don't know if that's any help but no i, th I thought that was that was very helpful look i, I think we could sit here all, all evening and carry on talking but I, I'm, I'm conscious of, of the need to close um and i'm going to close really with not a question but something for everyone to think about um, the question to the group um, was, given that mental health services are typically underfunded, what would be the best approach to embedding physical activity therapy resources and which competencies by which um, health workers are needed? What competencies do they need when working in mental health and their tools to turn for, for support? I'm not, I'm not saying we should try and uh, 
answer that one today because I think that's a whole a whole really what Flo and, and, and Simon uh, were referring to really about um, moving forward on that. Um, I'm sure I'm going to close by saying thank you very, very much indeed to, to Simon, to Flo and to Ellie. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, brilliant. Thank you so much for, for between you all sort of lightening up this subject and brightening it and giving it a real sense of, of life. Um, I need to thank Chris Clemens and, and Esther Hope who are both lurking somewhere in the app, in the, in the um, participants for their help in organising the seminar. Um, there's Esther, there's Chris. Um, this will all be recorded. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the questions are there in the chat. So if people want to, um, perhaps Chris or, or, or Esther, perhaps we can bring them, bring them, collect those questions and send them back out to the group so people can think about it. Um, and then we obviously need to make sure we get on the phone to Boris and tell him what he needs to do in this area, because clearly the people we've got here have, have got a lot of great ideas. So once again, thank you very much indeed, uh, everyone. Thanks for coming on this evening. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Nice to see you all. Bye now. <laughs>